Welcome to The Real Recovery Show. We are every Friday at noon, and it's been an amazing journey so far. Some really wonderful people have joined us on the show to share about their own personal vulnerable experiences so that other people can identify and see hope in their future and learn what they could do, where to go to get help, and, um, and get new insights into maybe some of the things that they've been doing themselves that they didn't even realize was a problem. Today's episode is, to me, a very powerful episode. Um, not only are we going to be interviewing somebody who uh, represents, who works at a recovery a treatment center, but we're also going to be talking about some more heavier topics and how, no matter how far down you go, um, there are things that can happen to shift your perception, to give you a new, a new drive to want to heal, and the way appears when the mind is ready. Um, and so we're going to be talking about topics like uh, suicide as well. Um, I personally, as you've known if you've seen uh, previous episodes, have uh, struggled with uh, so much, so many suicidal ideations that it could be considered um, one of my addictions. Um, whenever the fecal matter would hit the oscillating device, I would end up thinking, well, I could always just kill myself, and my mind would start planning it. Um, but it's kind of interesting because it wasn't just um, it wasn't just the fact that I felt like when I couldn't handle and I would hit do 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 overload that I would think about suicide that was my suicidal behavior. I remember one time being in a recovery event and the topic of suicide came up and people were talking about how they've never been suicidal ever in their life. So I'm sitting in a room full of people who have lots of addiction and they're healing from this, and some of them with PTSD, and all this, um, all this past of, uh, of riddled with addiction, and my mind was like, how do they not see that when you put a substance in your body or you put yourself in dangerous situations and, um, and uh, you do things, where you're destroying relationships and and your your own your own passion and your own will to live that you're not on some level committing suicide whether it's a slow cook because you have a food addiction that the doctors say if you don't stop you're going to have serious diabetes or um, or if you're drinking alcohol and your doc and the doctors are warning you that you know your liver is going to fail or or you've seen other people in your family who have died from addiction similar to yours, um, maybe even not as bad, and yet, and yet the solution of drugs and alcohol or whatever um, continues to be used um, as if it is the real solution. And, and so I believe, and this is my own opinion, um, as is everything I say on the show, um, that when we are addicted, we have like this split mind that is partially wanting to live and partially wanting to die. And so we're always dealing with that. So we will want to heal or we'll even use a substance to help us cope so that we can have a better chance, but then we'll also do things with a, you know, an attitude that whatever happens, happens. Um, and if I die, I die, right? And so um, I myself have, um, had to get to deeper and deeper levels of this isn't this isn't going to be what I want anymore, um, and and the last thing I'll say is as we have um, shown on uh, previous episodes, a bottom is not what happens to you outside of you. It is when there is a psychic shift in the mind that says enough, I'm done. I can't do this anymore like this. There has to be another way. And everybody, for everybody, it's different. And so while we're all like comparing our outsides and what's happened in our lives to us and by us, um, it's more helpful to recognize that the power of identification lies in focusing on how we also felt the same way, that we also um, felt out of control, that we also felt hopeless and helpless, and, um, and that if somebody else can rise up um, and heal, and have an amazing chance to have a better life than, than we can too. And then we get to be that example as well. 
Um, so um, one of our guests today um, had actually tried to commit suicide, um, succeeded-ish because he's still here um, and he was brought back, um, and then um, went through a whole period of time where um, he went through a new lease on life and a different um, focus on his recovery. Um, he also ended up with a new commitment and in his new commitment ended up going to um, a rehab and and the people that he met at the rehab and the system that he entered into matched his new desire. And so he's going to share about that, what happened, what led up to the suicide um, and his whole journey. And, um, and so thank you, Kyle Gray, for joining us here. Um, and then we also have um, Teresa Sands, who is a patient engagement manager at Landmark Recovery. And she also has a past where she's gone through a lot and she's in recovery as well and is very passionate about what she does. And um, and so they met there at um, Landmark Recovery and so she's gonna share as well about the process and we'll all have a really cool conversation. And so we're gonna start off as we usually do, um, turning the camera over to you, the mic to you, Kyle, and you can share you know, what it was like growing up for you and um, what led to that day that you um, wanted to commit suicide. Oh, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Lisa, for having me on here. And uh, wow, what a powerful opener because it hit me actually pretty home. And a lot of that, um, you know, a lot of what you just said is, you know, kind of where the mindset for me was uh, growing up and into that point of, uh, you know, where you think life is over for you. And uh, so I can say, and I'll start off by saying is, what a year can do in your life mm. if you have commitment and motivation and dedication to something different, uh, what transitions you can find in your life over a year. And mm -hmm. that's what I found this last year. Um, you know, but we'll take a little bit, you know, rewind and go all the way back, <laughs> uh, you know, so. I was born in the last year, the 80s, so I'd like to say I'm an 80s baby still, um, <laughs> you know, but I was born, uh, me, and, me and my twin brother, um, unfortunately, to uh, an addict, you know, our biological mother was an addict who had uh, us and two other children and she gave us all up for adoption. And uh, me and my twin brother were very, very lucky to um, be adopted to the family that we were adopted mm. to. Um, two people that uh, just were very loving, very caring. And, uh, you know, I I look back and I don't understand um, as a child why I wasn't so happy uh, with, with what was given to me. Um, and, you know, I didn't see what other people saw. And I think that stemmed from, uh, you know, maybe some, you know, genes from my biological mother that I got, uh, you know, and she was a, a crack addict and she was just, uh, you know, very selfish and very manipulative. And it was her way or the highway. You know, I got to meet her as an adult and I could, I was like, wow, this is kind of like me as an adult. Um, mm -hmm. So, as a child growing up, I was given every opportunity possible. And, uh, you know, I've been a recovering addict my entire life. And I think um, we don't recognize that addiction just isn't always substance, it's character defects. Mm -hmm. It's your personality um, that, that kind of dwindles with that. So growing up, I always felt like an oddball out of the box. It's not because I'm six foot 10 that I felt that way. <laughs> uh, but I just always felt like there's, I'm living within a shadow. Um, growing up, I used to put a towel, I'll remember, you know, I'll never forget a towel in front of the bathroom mirror whenever I was taking a shower or whatever it was because I didn't want to see who I was. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't feel like I was an actual person. I just felt like a shadow in this world. And that caused a lot of depression. Um, mm -hmm. And it, I started to isolate through the world through that. Um, you know, people used to come up to me and on the outside, we looked just so happy and so friendly and so this and that. I'm very, you know, very uh, personable person. But on the inside, I was already dying. Mm -hmm. um, I was having dreams of uh, what life would be like if I wasn't here. And I don't, I don't know where that started. Um, I really don't because I, you know, again, had every opportunity given to me um, mm -hmm. through a great family, you know, great loving family. Did you know you were adopted when you were a child? When did so, you find out? 
So my mother, adopted mother, she used to make a joke with us. Actually, she uh, they, they they were always up front with us. My my father and mother that adopted us, uh, they always were up front with us, and they uh, they said, you know, you were adopted, and no, uh, we didn't know what that meant. Okay. Uh, but I guess my mother used to say that we would go in the grocery store and be like, hey, we're adopted. I have no <laughs> idea what that meant, but you know, we're adopted. Um, but I think towards middle school i started to realize you know with all of my friends um that we were the only ones that were adopted mm. and it really started to hit home for me and i felt at first that i just wasn't wanted yeah and i think i started to rebel a little bit based off of that um under thinking that you're you know you're a child that someone didn't want even though i wasn't even recognizing you have two loving parents right. that wanted you and adopted right. you and given you every opportunity right. of life uh you know they they just uh i just couldn't get that out of my head so um yeah that's it, it so was, very interesting because that's for me in my childhood you know with my mom saying that you know she wished i was never born and she regretted having me both my parents were in addiction and so i also had that you know wow like i shouldn't have been born maybe and i wasn't really wanted but yet i am here and maybe i should be here and like so that for me <clears throat> started that exact same kind of characteristic of feeling like maybe i don't i i don't want to see myself i don't want to know who i am because um whatever it is about me is so undesirable that my own mother you know would say that right yeah. so that's why i asked that just just for that because i saw oh that's interesting that he had that same behavior mm -hmm. around that and that feeling like there's something wrong with me yeah and there, it's just there's more like it's it's interesting you know even as as children that we don't even recognize that there's things that attach to us dark wise yeah. that can lead us into substances so um you know I was dying and suffering on the inside. People didn't know about it. You know, mm -hmm. I was always very, had always had a smile on the outside, but dying on the inside, mm -hmm. suffering on the inside, mm -hmm. wanting to die on the inside, um, that I started to notice we always, you know, some friends always have that cool mom on the block that that would drink or would, or just do any, anything. Uh, and we noticed that whenever she had a party, uh, everybody was laughing and having a great time and I, I f at first couldn't understand why mm -hmm. and, you know but we started noticing the great shelf that you see by the kitchen yeah. with all these wonderful bottles of things and the moment they started consuming that it was amazing so you know we get the idea as a as 13 years old uh, to go in and try that one night and I'll never forget throwing up the first time um, but then but I I recognize that all the worries and all the suffering and all the, you know, just anything that I thought about life that I, you know, I, I just didn't want to be a part of went away. Mm -hmm. And I was able to laugh on the outside and the inside for the first time. Mm. And so um, it affected me in this positive way. And I said, okay, this, this, this is cool. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wasn't the guy that went and stole alcohol or did anything like that. We would just consume it in a safe environment, you know, as, as, the, as the cool mom would tell you. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to drink at my house, do it in, you know, we'd rather you do it here than out there. Uh -huh. So, uh, you know, we looked forward to going every single weekend and kind of doing that um, growing up. Mm. And so my entire teenage years was suffering, Drinking, I didn't really consume any hard drugs or anything like that, um, but it was just more drinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I was very career-driven person, so I, I would I would become this attached person to certain things and just run with it and forget everything else on the side. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, unfortunately, I started pushing my family to the side and focusing straight on a career because I saw money. I had you know an uncle at the time who I idolized um, that had a lot of money and uh he owned nightclubs and and i was just like man i want everything you've got not even realizing that you're the exact worst person i should be idolizing <laughs> but i did idolize right. that person and so at a very very young age when i graduated high school i went and opened up a nightclub here in las vegas as a marketing director oh, in one of the local hotels and i wasn't old enough to be in the club oh, but i was running their marketing and reporting oh, wow. numbers to one of the casino operators you know <laughs> and uh every single night um, I was consuming alcohol because it was my safeguard. That was mm -hmm. my that was me being able to smile on the inside and, and on the outside. And uh, so it just became an attachment for me. Uh, I started lying. Uh, you know, I when I think about what I've stolen from people, I stole time. I stole time from my family. Mm -hmm. And um, as time went on, after I started, you know, growing up, graduating high school, 
seeing the effect that I had on my family, the, the guilt started to show up. Mm -hmm. And so uh, looking back, there's characteristics of just, you, you had malicious selfishness, you, you, you stole people's time, you created havoc for anybody that was around you because of liquor. And you know, at, um, when I got to the clubs, I started doing drugs, mm -hmm. but uh, the guilt started to show up. So I'm like, okay, how do I mask the guilt now? now now, no matter even if I'm drinking, I'm still feeling guilty. Right. So I went to other substances mm -hmm. and I said, you know, I started realizing that there's a solution and it's not by going to get help. It's not talking to somebody because mm -hmm. I didn't talk to anybody. Um, I just kept it all on the inside because I didn't want people to think that I was suffering. That was the one thing about me. I was like, I'm six foot 10, I'm a boss. I'm, the, I'm, right. I'm going to be a career driven, right. successful person. I'm not struggling right. and I didn't want people to see that. So um, I started using substances every day and then right when I, uh, I, I'd say about a year into the nightclub, I, I figured, you know what, I'm, I'm going to die. You know, I'm suffering. I'm just, I'm drinking uh, uh, water bottles full of vodka. Mm. Uh, you know, this isn't right. I'm not even 21 yet. Yeah. So I figured, okay. Let me cha have a change of scenery because I thought that would change, you know, everything. So I moved to Los Angeles mm -hmm. and I started working at a record label out there. And I was working with a lot of artists and so I was on the road well, a lot. That's definitely better. Yeah. <laughs> So, well, I'll never forget every morning my boss, because I was, again, a career-driven person. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to see the outside world. I would be given pills on my desk every morning to, to continue working. Mm -hmm. And so my entire life, uh, you know, in Los Angeles, all four years that I was there, it felt like that movie Click with Adam Sandler. Mm -hmm. I was literally fast-forwarding life um, mm -hmm. if there was an issue and pressing play on the good parts of life. Yeah. And that's not a way to live either. That's profound. Yeah. So I woke up one day in Los Angeles living, the, uh, living in a beautiful high-rise apartment. And I was like, wow, four years of my life went by. I, mm -hmm. I've drinking my life away. I, I was like, oh, obviously the scenery didn't happen. And uh, I was suffering still on the inside. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I started journaling everything that I was suffering about. And I felt like nothing was working. I mm -hmm. still would not talk to anybody. Um, I, I just thought I could handle everything on my own. Um, I thought I could self detox on my own. And, uh, you know, I just kept praying that life eventually would work out. That is really a good point. A lot of times, um, even if it starts out to be able to be around people and to socialize, addiction starts to become more and more isolatory. And it's that, yeah. it's that disconnect from other people. It's that feeling of being alone. Even when you're with people, it's, um, it's the shame and then the guilt piled onto the shame that starts to make... Um, it starts to make whatever we're doing not work as well. So we have to do more or different things like you are switching and having more drugs and stuff like that. It's, um, and then more guilt, more shame. And yeah. so like, it's like we're, it's like we're piling up all this stuff that we're stuffing and we're not interacting with people that we can start letting some of this stuff out in a healthy way. And we don't even know how and who we're supposed to be able to do this with anyway, because we're so obsessed with our self concept and nothing to see here, smoke and mirrors that, um, we're just piling all this stuff up and we're getting more and more toxic for even ourselves. And, um, it's, it becomes worse and worse, even if we look like we have it all together and we're succeeding. And that's why a lot of people think that a bottom is when you lose everything. It doesn't have to be mm -hmm. even. You just start to get to a point where, I guess, your own toxicity becomes smelly to you. You know, like you just can't get to, you just can't get high enough. You can't outrun it enough. You can't be present anymore for any kind of relationship in yourself and you don't know why but all the things that we end up doing that creates more discord more conflict in our lives more seeming failures or whatever like that in whatever way we think we should be able to live and have relationships or whatever just piles more guilt and more shame onto it which is the very thing we're running from and so we have to eventually get if we're going to make it a new way of processing that stuff and and healing so i really appreciate everything you're sharing go ahead <laughs> yeah no so uh you know like like what you said it you know in the beginning of the show at first you you find this place where you're like i give up i'm tired i'm not i'm 23 years old at the time and mm -hmm. i'm exhausted i feel like i'm like 70 years old mm -hmm. i was like i'm out of energy i was like i've drugged up for the last how many years alcoholed up for some odd reason, I've always been successful in corporate America. I, I don't understand why I've, I've never really missed a gap with that. So I said, 
I, you know, I, I woke up one day and I was like, I'm going back to Vegas and I'm going to live just this, this straight, narrow edge life thinking everything's going to solve my problems. I went and got my broker's licenses uh, with investments, joined a, a big time bank and uh, started giving people financial advice. And I thought this will cure everything. I said, mm -hmm. I also, I want a family. I was like, I want the brick, you know, the brick house, whatever, you know, it yeah. is, uh, you know, I want to get married, have kids, have the house, have everything that will solve the rest of the problems. And so, you know, I came back and with one month, one month of being back, you know, conceived my first child. And, uh, you know, I was thinking, okay, if I have well, kids. you're an overachiever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just figured that if you have kids, you're just going to be sober. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't think that uh, parents are, you know, addicts. And mm -hmm. uh, so I, I just thought I'll, I'll sober up after having kids. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, that wasn't the case. I had three kids back to back, 10, 9, and 8. Uh, you know, beautiful daughters that are just are my life. And um, so years went on and then I tried the hard stuff. I was like, you know what? My life's starting to really become unmanageable again. I said, you know, and so I tried the hard stuff for the very first time. I was a late bloomer and uh, lost everything mm -hmm. in literally two months. I lost my house. I lost my car job that I had for seven years. I lost the final respect of my family, uh, mm -hmm. the final respect of the friends that I had. Um, I just lost everything. And, you know, you'd think that was enough, right. um, but it wasn't. Right. I kept going just a little bit longer. Right. I went to, um, I just went into a corner and started praying and praying and praying. And uh, a year goes by and then finally, you know, I make this premeditated decision. I, I said, life's over for me. I was like, I don't want to see my kids suffer. I, I didn't want to be the parent that my biological mother was, you mm -hmm. know, I don't look up to that type of person. Mm -hmm. And I said, I turned into that person. Mm -hmm. And I thought there's no other solution but to, to leave this earth. You know, I've, um, I, I'm about to explode. So I googled how to do it. Um, I figured a toxic way on how to create, uh, you know, a toxic cocktail and make it happen. And um, unfortunately, I did it in a family member's house. Um, I did it around family members, um, and they ended up finding me. And uh, I, I succeeded, I guess. Uh, Eighteen hours later, I woke up in the hospital, and uh, you know the ER nurse that was there that night, February fifth, twenty twenty-two, uh, is when I ended up in that hospital. Um, she said you died yesterday. I got off the night shift and now I'm here at the night shift again and I'm just checking on you because you made it. And I said, made what? And she said, well, you killed yourself yesterday. Um, you OD'd and uh, we had to Narcan you six times. I don't, I didn't know what Narcan meant, but mm -hmm. I realized that six Narcans is quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my first reaction is I'm very upset that it didn't work. Mm -hmm. I, you know, this was my way out. And uh, looking back, that's such a selfish way uh, to end your life and to leave, you know, anything behind. You know, I didn't think of my daughters, which I should have. Um, but addiction takes over your mind to the point where you don't think about anything but yourself. Yeah. And that's selfish. Yeah. And it's, it's just... It's addiction. Yeah. Yeah. We did an episode interviewing Brandon Novak, and he said that his whole, um, his whole mantra was... It's not personal, it's just business. Yeah. Like, the addiction comes first no matter what. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the addiction did. It, it finally took over. Um, and that's where the miracle happened for me. You know, I didn't really believe in, uh, you know, in some churches you see people get saved from the wheelchairs and stuff. And they're like, oh, I've been saved. Mm -hmm. You know, but the miracle happened that day. Something in, inside of me told me that uh, if... <laughs> If I've been brought back to life, then there's got to be a reason. So I don't know what it had in me, uh, but I had this hospital gown on. I had IVs in my arms and things like that, dropped to the ground. And I literally say, God, if I can't manage my own life, here's your here. You know, I lay my life at your hands. If you have direction on what to do, I will do whatever it takes. And at that moment, um, you know, thank, I'm just thankful for my twin brother. Um, he, he called around and he, and he found help. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, which, you know, I didn't deserve that. I didn't deserve my twin brother's respect nor for his help. 
Um, but you know, he did it anyways. And that, and that's, that's love, you know, and I'm just thankful for that because he, he called a guy named Dwight Hansey that owns the Hansey house out here, sober living. And at first Dwight's response is, I'm not an Uber and I'm not a taxi service. So I'm not going to go pick this guy up. Um, but weirdly enough, he said that God reached out and touched him. He said he had never picked anybody up. Mm. He went to that hospital. And at, at first when he saw me, he's like, Oh no, I can't help him out right now. <laughs> he's like, look at him. He's yeah. like, what am I going to do with him? Right. But he's like, but Dwight said, hold on. He's like, now I'm going to go pick up the phone because now I've got a place that you can go if you're willing and ready. And finally you've hit that, you know, point where you're just yeah. done and you want to make a transition in life. I've got a place for you. Nice. And so mm -hmm. he reached out to Landmark Recovery. And at first I'm like, I'm above rehabs. I'm not that guy. Right. I, I'm a. I'm not right. an addict. I'm yeah. nothing like that. You know, right. I can handle my life. Even and though you just prayed and said whatever exactly. you tell me to do. Exactly. But I'm back. I've had some sleep. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, I did it anyways. Yeah. I said, you know, and I thought back to exactly what you just said. I was like, you know what? I'm not even listening to what I just got right. on my hands and knees to do. <laughs> so he picks up right. the phone and calls Landmark. And... Uh, Fuck. Sorry if I say that word, but you know what? I am forever grateful. Yeah. That was February 6, 2022 that that happened. Um, and he drove me over to Landmark. And at first when I got there, I was like, 40 guys? I was like, what is this place? I was like, you know, I'm going to lose my mind. I'm, right. I'm, I'm Mr. Cool Guy. I'm Mr. Selfish, Mr. Manipulator. You know, I don't right. need to be here. Who are all these people? And I'll tell you what, the staff over at Landmark, you know, said, put me in my place pretty well. They're like, you're 6'10", but they we'll knock you, you right down. <laughs> They're um, like, oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and one of the most rewarding experiences, I'll, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll say, you know, before turning over to Teresa, I met Teresa over there. And really what where the miracle happened was the staff came up to me the next morning and they said, look, you're considered detox. Um, you can stay in this room for 10 days and you don't have to go to class. You could just sit here. And I was like, well, I'm not just going to sit here uh, for 10 days. I was like, what, what is what uh, what other opportunity is there here? Yeah. And they're like, well, there's classes. And I said, I got on my hands and knees for a reason. I was brought over here for a reason. I said, so let me figure out and see what this class is all about. And my jaw dropped the very first class. Mm -hmm. um, this, this lady named Gwen, uh, just, she really touched my heart. And uh, she just started talking about the character defects that we have as a child mm -hmm. or, um, you know, as adolescents and where our lives are today based on personality. Yeah. So they didn't really just, you know, dive into addiction right away. They wanted to find the root. Cause and condition. Yeah. Absolutely. And I was like, my entire life, I've been wanting to find the root of my mm -hmm. unhappiness. You know, mm -hmm. I should have, I've had everything afforded to me. I should never have had, you know, been unhappy. Mm -hmm. So where did it come from? And mm -hmm. so she put it into a perspective that I, that I wanted to hear. And I walked out of that class just amazed. And so mm -hmm. I kept going to every single class. The 10th day was about to come up and they were just going to release me. And I went over to Teresa and I said, look, I said, I don't, I've heard that this course or this, this action, you know, is, is actually longer than 10 days. I was like, for me, I need more help than probably most of these 40 guys up in here. Uh, you know, I'll be the first one to admit it now, Yeah. Uh, now that I'm more clear headed. And so I asked her, I said, what, how long is the program? And at the time, I think she, they said it was 47 days. And I said, well, sign me up. I'm going to be here all 47 days. I'm going to attend every single class. I I want to be of service to the other people in there. Um, I got a service commitment in there, believe it nice. or not. I went and uh, met the janitor and every morning and at morning and at night, I helped them take out the trash. Nice. I just wanted to do things that were different that I didn't do before. I was a selfish human being. So I felt like as we're going through this class, finding these character defects, mm. let me do the opposite this time. Let me take action. Let me, you know, let me just make that movement. And nice. uh, it literally, you know, the 47 days went by quick, but the one thing I can't express enough, and I did, you know, to a lot of the guys in there, if, if you want to change your life, right. you have to be committed. Yes. You have to be passionate about it. You have it. to be all in. Yeah, you have, you have to, to be, be all in, in or, or it's nothing. Yeah. So uh, that changed, that was the foundation that changed my life. Um, I realized that, you know, when I got out, I don't deserve my girls. Um, you know, my daughters, I let them down, you know, I don't mm -hmm. deserve my family. I lost the respect and relationships mm -hmm. still to this day of my family. And that's something that I'll never get back. Um, 
Maybe, but I don't deserve it regardless. Mm -hmm. I did learn that. Uh, you don't have the expectations of it. Correct. But I realized that, uh, you know, my daughters don't deserve either not to have their father. Mm -hmm. And you need to take you need to take action in your life um, instead of ruining people's yeah. lives and robbing time from other people because they may end up the same way you did. And uh, that affected me. That affected me hard. So I was able to leave Landmark still having guilt, and but I had remorse. So mm -hmm. I learned how to express what I was feeling for one, mm -hmm. but then also turning it into a positive action and saying, okay, let me write down the remorse, the guilt. Let me find a way on how to approach things the right way and let me serve other people and let me live out the rest of my life doing that. And so a couple of weeks ago, I had a year of sobriety and yes. you know, that was awesome to me. That was something that was very important and moving forward, it's, it's me just going out there and wanting to kind of share the story and tell you one suicide for one is not the option. You don't even realize who you're affecting when you try to do that. Or who you're even trying to kill. Right. You don't even know. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, at this point we're going to take a break. And please remember that the opinions expressed here are strictly those of the people who gave them and do not represent any 12-step program or should replace your own intuition or professional medical advice. See you in a bit. back to the real recovery show remember you can watch us on facebook on youtube on amazon fire tv and you can listen to us on the phlv radio app or you can get our podcast on apple podcasts spotify our heart radio um, and all of our episodes are all posted on the meeting space.com so please share on facebook or with anybody if you're inspired to and help us get the word out um, if you're interested in being on a future episode, there's an intake form as well that you could fill out and, um, and let us know what you're inspired to speak to. There's a whole bunch of topics you could pick from. And, um, and if you're just curious about it, you could just uh, reach out through the contact form on the meeting space as well. So that's themeetingspace.com. And so uh, before the break, we got to hear about uh, Kyle's journey, and, um, and he landed at the end with... Uh, landed with Landmark Recovery. Ha, there we go. And so nice. we're gonna take uh, the story from there and we're gonna switch gears to Teresa Sands, who again is the patient engagement manager at Landmark Recovery. And she's gonna share a little bit about herself first. Absolutely. And then she's gonna go into how they ended up meeting and what to be expected at uh, Landmark Recovery, so. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me, Lisa and Kyle. Very much appreciated. I'm happy to be here. So again, my name is Teresa. I am the patient engagement manager at Landmark in Las Vegas. I myself am a person in long-term recovery from all the things and more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you would have told me I was going to be in the recovery field five years ago, I would have told you where to shove it. <laughs> um, I never thought for a second this would be something I would be doing, let alone be here with you guys now sharing this message of hope. Um, I came from a background of entertainment. I was in the entertainment industry for 18 plus years. My father was a musician. Mm -hmm. um, my mother was a groupie in his band. Oh, cute. Good, yeah. <laughs> Big age difference. Um, she's going to kill me when she watches this. She always talks to my social media. So I'll be getting a phone call. Um, How old did you say I was? <laughs> yeah, right? Okay, so my father actually retired um, after my mother gave birth to me in order to kind of get a career that was going to be more suitable for having a kid. But he always was very involved um, in practicing his bass, and music was always a part of my life. 
And I kind of learned very early on in order to relate with him and really share space together, I needed to be also musically inclined. It was kind of the only, mm -hmm. only language that we both could have in common. Um, he was a great father. He did the best he could with what he, what he had. Um, very Sicilian upbringing. We don't talk about the chaos. Um, mm -hmm. You know, figure it out. Mm -hmm. You know, don't bring that to the dinner table. Um, my mom and him were separated right off the bat. I was only a couple months old. My mom suffers from her own mental health issues. And she, one thing I can say about her is that she always tried to be involved in my life to the best of her ability. It just mm -hmm. always wasn't the most uh, cohesive for me. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of physical, mental, all the above kind of abuse when I would go and visit with her and mm -hmm. um, the men that she was involved with. And uh, there so you lived with your father? I did. I was okay. a daddy's girl, still a daddy's okay. girl. Yeah, 100 percent. And I kind of learned early on that the only way to kind of get attention was to almost self-destruct. I, I remember, sick as it sounds, I would pray to God, like, let me suffer from some kind of terminal disease in order to gain their attention. I would bite the insides of my cheeks and spit the blood out in the toilet and just go get my, my father and be like, look what's wrong with me, just to get that reaction. So that's mm -hmm. kind of, I was always looking for attention when I was younger. I could see that though, because yeah. if your mom is up in her head and she has all that stuff going on and your dad's all in his music and so focused on that, you feel invisible. Mm -hmm. And my dad worked, he worked his, worked his butt off just to put food and stuff on the table. And mm -hmm. um, I respect that now when I was younger, not so much, I didn't understand. You know, yeah. but my house, it grew up in my house was the party house. Like, yeah. um, he wasn't really home. Uh, I did have a stepmother that was involved in my life from about three to 15. And they did put me in a Catholic private school. So I grew up with nuns and not to date myself, but I am older. <laughs> <laughs> um, with that whole shebang. And again, like made sure I was in all the plays. My dad did the music for mm -hmm. all the plays. Um, I, I had to have all the solos or he didn't love me and just mm -hmm. that whole that whole uh, song and dance. And um, hmm. I got really good at my craft. Like I would learn every single song on Christina Aguilera's repertoire mm -hmm. and I would just practice. And I always felt different from everybody and I didn't really know why. And I think a lot of us that suffer from this disease yeah. feel that way. Mm -hmm. Always like I'm on the outside of the room looking in and no matter how many people I was around or I just didn't feel like I belonged anywhere. The only time I ever felt in my skin was when I was on stage. It was the mm -hmm. only time I ever felt seen, the only time I ever felt heard. And so I just ran with it and I got really good at what I did. And um, yeah, you know, it's really interesting yeah. because when we are, um, as, as Kyle was saying too, we're so focused on the outside and we're so focused on the attention or like interacting with people from here out that um, we're not actually having any kind of real true honoring of our internal experience. And so while, because I very much identify with you, you know, I was, feel I felt invisible and I also wanted that attention and I also felt like I was seeking and seeking mm -hmm. outside of me. And the only time that I felt really good and in my own skin, so to speak, and fine was when I got the attention back. And so while I'm like hungry, looking for that, I'm feeling different, less mm -hmm. than, starving, something's wrong with me, right? right? But then when I get it, it's like it's 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 like I'm finally able to to be with what I feel like I need because I'm going anywhere but here, anybody but me, mm -hmm. anytime but now. So I love that you're sharing it that way. Thank you for that. Yeah. Continue. So in high school, I ended up switching from the uh, Catholic school I was attending to a public school, okay. which was a culture shock. Yeah. Um, the stepmom that I had involved, she actually left my father for um, her drug dealer. I did not know she was on methamphetamines. Mm -hmm. um, I just remember very odd behavior in the house. I would come home from school and she would have vacuumed the stairs, yeah. and I'd walk up the. I would have walked up the middle just of the a stairs. Just really a clean person. Right. I don't understand. Nothing to see here. Well, <laughs> even more so, I'd walk up the stairs and then I'd get a backhand, and she'd be like, "Hey." walk up the side of the stairs. It's just very strange behavior. Right. She would go through my stuff being like, are you on drugs? And I'm like, what are drugs? Like, what right. are you talking about, right? So I didn't really understand until I was much older what had happened. Um, but I remember her pulling me into the room and said, she said, who do you want to live with, me or your father? And I was like, my father, it's my, my blood right. father, right? So she, that was it, she was gone. I did have a little stepbrother at the time. I think he was like two or three. She took him, that was the last time I really saw him until much, much later. 
Um, and it was just me and my dad. And uh, I went to a public high school. I went to Centennial High School. And again, I came from a Catholic school environment. I did not belong for sure. So I went through the whole, well, how am I going to dress? Am I going to dress like these kids? Am I going to dress right. like these kids? Like, right. Finally, I felt like I found a group. And um, they were, you know, the cheerleaders and the cool kids. And I was like, all right, cool. Like, I belong here. And as time went on, I'm, I'm in like my junior year, I think, I noticed they're conjugating and they're whispering and they're talking. And of course, to me at that time, I'm like, oh, they're talking about me. They don't mm -hmm. like me. Right. It's me. Because we're so outward focused, right. wanting the attention, the approval. Exactly. exactly. So I'm at a party and I pull my best friend at the time um, into the garage and I say, I know you guys are doing something. Something's going on. You're going to tell me, is it me? What's happening? She goes, no, 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 that's not it let me show you what we're doing. And she's like, do you really want to know? And I said, yeah, I really want to know. Whatever you're doing, I want to know and I want to be a part of it, right? So she pulls me into her room and they were doing methamphetamines. And the first drug I ever tried was methamphetamine. Um, you know, and I thought I was doing great, but they were like, hey, you need to calm down. My mom is going to catch on to what's going on here. And I'm like, it's fine. We're great. Everything's <laughs> great. I'm great. You're great. Well, you know, you have those friends, even, you know, much more advanced in your drug career where they can party on the weekends they can smoke methamphetamine casually like a gentleman and it's strange right <laughs> like and then gentleman. go go perform <laughs> surgery the next day on, you know and you're right. like why am i still up two days later trying right. to find more and right. that was me and again right. i was becoming an embarrassment to them so um shun from that group i met a guy I'll which is one of the worst things that could happen right. to somebody who's looking for validation right exactly yeah. exactly well i met a guy and he became my father mother sister brother my entire world and was absolutely uh, head over guy. heels yes. in love with this man uh -huh. um that was it we were soulmates for life um unfortunately he was really into pills mm -hmm. i was really into uppers so i was like that's lame um, but he would give me things now and then. So he wanted and, to go down, you wanted right, to go up. Right, right, yeah. whatever. Here Not we on are. the same lane. <laughs> um, so uh, he was dealing with his own struggles, and I remember his family, there'd be like a blood pressure cup in his in his room, and they would kind of say, like, he's dealing with these issues, but I didn't know what addiction was. Mm. I didn't know what withdrawal was. I just knew I liked meth, and when I didn't have it, I was tired, right? Mm -hmm. um, long story short, we were always together, 24-7, one day he does not answer his phone and I am beside myself. How could you abandon me? Um, and he's like, he finally calls me. And he's like, I don't feel good. I just threw up outside of my gate. Um, I'm going to go lay down. You can come over in the morning. Or if you want to come over tonight, I'd really appreciate it. I do remember that. He asked if I wanted to come over that night. And I was pissed. I was like, you, you didn't want to be a part of my day. You know, I'll see you tomorrow. Click. And then get a call about 5 o'clock the next morning that he had passed away from mm -hmm. his brother. And that was what broke my brain. I try mm -hmm. to tell people, like, that was when mm -hmm. I realized that the world was not what I thought it was, broke right? Broke your brain. Yeah, yeah broke my I brain. get the chills. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he was in the Mormon faith, and so I knew how his family was going to react, mm -hmm. and I knew he would go in his closet, and he would come out of his closet, and he would have pills. So I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to clean out his room so his family doesn't have to do that. Well, no, I found 15 bottles of Roxy's and Oxy's and everything above, because this was during, like, the opioid mm -hmm. you know, epidemic. And I uh, took those with me. And that kind of what skyrocketed the Oxycontin um, addiction that I had. Uh, after that, I spent many years um, falling asleep in the cemetery, snorting Roxy's off of his grave. Um, I didn't want to be alive. I was okay with dying. Um, I would wake up when the sprinklers would come on in the cemetery or someone told me I had to leave. And that's how I spent many years of my mm -hmm. life. Um, but I also on a positive note gave me the motivation yeah. because I had no fear for anything. I didn't care if I died, so why would I care if there I... There is something very powerful right? about that. I feel like when you're like, when you're completely out of, like, when you get to a place where you're like, you know what, um, what do I have to lose? Yeah. yeah. What do I have to lose? Like, I'm, I don't have anything I really care about now other than... Like, I might as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For the sake of time, I'll speed this up a little because I could probably ramble for three <laughs> hours, which we don't have. Um, Can't we all? <laughs> but I started doing bigger auditions because mm -hmm. I had no fear. And I booked bands and I started touring. And my life was drug, sex, and rock and roll. And the worse I got into my addiction, the better I looked for everyone else. And I was mm -hmm. a brand. And, you know, my whole life was staying relevant. And what pictures I was going to post on mm -hmm. my social media and me, 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 me. And without that, I had no idea who I was. Um, I got so heavy into my addiction that I wasn't able to support myself financially and I started stripping. I have no ill in 
fillings towards those Me that either. work in the sex industry. Really a lot, not, a lot of my right? friends still do it. That's great. Did whole episodes on yeah. it. Didn't <laughs> didn't work for me personally. You know, for me it was the psyche of not being able to tell somebody no, don't touch because you needed the money. That mm-hmm. really messed with me. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that strip club, I met my soon-to-be husband. He was a drug dealer, and my friends at the club said that he had this, that, and the other. And I said, let's go. So every interaction I had with love um, was transactional Mm -hmm. up until very recently Mm -hmm. um we were together um we did the whole song and dance we decided to both go to treatment stayed sober for many years um i had my son epic he's eight now Mm -hmm. and uh the day i gave birth to epic should have been the greatest day of my life well they gave me delighted and laura tab sent me home and i Mm -hmm. that was it i was off to the races Mm -hmm. i was off to the races and i was also i believe now suffering from postpartum depression which Mm -hmm. i didn't really recognize at the time i couldn't connect with him again i had my head up my own butt and i was worried about when am i going to go back on stage when am i going to lose the baby weight Mm -hmm. oh my gosh like i can't post anything about myself just nonsense yeah completely gypped myself of the whole experience yeah um ran my now ex-husband um into the ground in regards to like i would work at nightclubs all night um i would come home when the sun came up uh i wasn't present i did tell him i was struggling with the lower tabs um, thinking it was going to help um, I had just filled, I went to the doctor I used to go to, just filled my Roxy's and my Adderall, just got that prescription. I pull up in front of our house. We had this nice house in Summerlin. Life was good, no stress, no problems. He, I was acting erratic. He opens the glove department and there's my drugs. He said, you're going to West Care. I said, all right, let's go to West Care. Go to West Care. He's not there to pick me up. Go home. There's my stuff in trash bags. Mm-hmm. His mother's bringing it outside. Mm-hmm. Lo- you know, doors were locked. I held resentment against that for a long time um, until I realized my part in it. In fact, he's in uh, the recovery space, and so we have a lot of cross mutual friends. And I'll sometimes hear his story, and I'll, and I'm like, wait, there's two sides of a story. Yeah. Yeah. What he's saying. Don't listen to him tell his story. Oh my gosh. (laughs) He's a great dad and a great man. So, and you know, things are good now. But yeah. So then I was out on the street. Um, I ended up trying to live with my mom. That was a terrible idea. Mm-hmm. Um, eventually got my own place doing shows. I would do shows for Insomniac in front of 300,000 people. Mm-hmm. Life was good. I'd come home, I'd take my costume off and I would just cry. Yeah. yeah. I would just cry, you know, like I was nothing. I was an empty shell. The more people I was around, the worse the I felt. The more we feed the outside and we don't address yeah. the inside, the worse we get, but we think that's yeah. our solution. Yeah. And this isn't even just an addiction. This is our whole society. Mm-hmm. Mind you, my body's deteriorating. I, I went to heroin. Um, you know, he left me and that was it. I was heartbroken. And I think um, a lot of my lifetime was spent trying to replace the first love I had with everybody else mm-hmm. and everybody else. And I never saw it for what it was Mm -hmm. um had a girl show up in my house for a show she was sleeping on my couch and she had all the good things the louis the rings and i said i know you don't make this much money what's going on she's like i have a sugar daddy i said what the hell is a sugar daddy (laughs) she's like i'm gonna sign you up for this site i said let's go right so to speed this up a little bit um the first guy that comes into my inbox i said this is it this is the answer this guy this man is 70 years old Mm -hmm. um he tells me eventually after time goes on a if you quit working and quit dancing i will pay all your bills but you know you got to come visit me out in georgia every now and then so Mm -hmm. i'm going back and forth i would bring like three thousand dollars with the heroin on the plane with me and Mm -hmm. one time it just did not come i was dope sick but i had to go because he was getting angry that was the worst plane ride of my life in the middle seat jumping and jiving i get there i say look i have a problem i can't hide it like i am withdrawing i'm a heroin addict i understand that this is probably this but like can you help me he sends me to a treatment center in georgia um and as i'm there he's bringing me jewelry like i think what by the time i left that rehab center i had a ring on every hand and necklaces earrings and i'm like look at me i'm the queen of rehab right? like, <laughs> let's go i got dollars for the vending machine like, let's go well i didn't really see it for what it was until after i got out um and he had picked me up he said i'm gonna take your phone i'm gonna give you this new phone um i'm gonna have you stay in my condo until we figure out a better situation mind you he had been paying my bills i had an apartment back in las vegas with my my kid I had a car um, he goes I put your car in the shop we're gonna fix it up he's got this issue all right I mean I paid you know blah 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 finally you know I get to a point where I'm like this is not healthy this is weird you're 70 years old this is not what I want to do anymore I'm sober like I need to go back home to my kid mm-hmm. well I'm sorry that you feel that way because that apartment you had you're evicted from I put a mechanical lien on your car and the cell phone that I gave you has been tapped I've listened to everything you said and by the way I have all these pictures of you so good luck Wow um, he and ended up basically um, sex trafficking me 
Um, it, I did not know what it was until much later. I still struggle with it. I think that when you go through those things, you mm -hmm. don't, it's hard to identify what happened to you, right? And you're like, well, was it because I was doing this? And um, so I would now and then Google I want to do an episode on sex trafficking, so maybe um, have you back for that. Yeah, yeah, I would love to be a part of that. Um, and he was a very prominent person here in Las Vegas and out in Georgia, so I've always been very careful with how I um, tackled that. But recently I've been Googling his name every now and then just to see, like, what happened? What really happened mm -hmm. to me? And I found out that he is in prison and he caught 10 felony charges. Wow. So, which is, I mean, that's not great, but it also was validation that yeah. this wasn't a good person. It wasn't because I deserved it. And so that's a whole, I guess, show. <laughs> that is, it, I love your story and I'm so grateful that you went more into it because there's just so much to it that people can... Um, can see and identify with and so where what ended up happening that you ended up working at landmark okay so um i got stuck in georgia after all that i ended up getting my life together enough to get a car and drive back out um, i came here i was homeless i parked my 2000 feet 2005 Jeep Liberty on top of the different casino employee parking and put clothes up in the windows until I got kicked out. Mm -hmm. um, finally saved enough money to get a Seagull suite and I lived there. I got my kid back, I got my life back and I, when I was stuck in Georgia, I had to strategize how I was gonna save enough money to get back, right? And I'm like, and me and my attic brain being as crafty as I can be, I'm like, I'm gonna go to school. I'm gonna go to college so mm -hmm. I can get the disbursement check. So mm -hmm. I enrolled myself at Indiana Tech while I'm dealing with all the nonsense in Georgia um, and just for the student loan disbursements. And I said, what am I gonna go to school for? What do I know a lot about? Well, drugs. I'm gonna go to school to be a drug counselor. And I'm still high, by, right. the, way, by the way. Like <laughs> I had relapsed right after treatment dealing with what I was dealing with, but I did it and I saved money. I came back over from Georgia and you know, I, I brought a former patient um, from the rehab center I went with who I ended up marrying um, in Georgia and uh, we had both relapse um, on IV meth, which wasn't great, but mm -hmm. I caught four, uh, four charges on the way from Georgia to Las Vegas in that 2005 Jeep Liberty for possession, went to jail in four different places, four different states, and ended up with four warrants at the end of it. Um, me and her were together for a little while. She slipped up um, and I had gotten custody back of Epic, finally 50-50, because I did lose it and that was probably the worst moment of my life. And in order to keep him and to keep my sanity, I moved out of that place and got my own place with him. Um, and during that time, I found a job posting for Landmark as a tech. And I think at the time, honestly, I was like eight months sober, okay? Um, but I was like, this is gonna align with what I wanna do. This is what I need right now. This aligns with my school and I'm gonna go for it. And honestly, like Kyle said, Landmark saved your life. Like honestly, Landmark saved my life. If I wouldn't have put myself in a space around other people in yeah, recovery absolutely. that knew more than I did, that worked programs, that had advice, like I was not a patient, but I sure felt like one for the first couple months of working yeah. there, you know? And I feel like that was the only thing that helped me heal from what I went through is to share my testimony with the patients, hear those. And even to this day, like if I'm having a bad day and I'm dealing with staffing issues and I go down on the floor and I hang out with, you know, the patients, that's what keeps me going. That's my motivation, you know. Um, long story long, she ended up actually overdosing and passing away. Mm. Um, and that was, you know, the second one that I had, had to uh, bury. But I can now say um, through a lot of personal interflection and therapy and things like that, I'm in a healthy relationship with my current girlfriend. She is not in recovery. She's never really done drugs. Um, oh, it's strange. Leveling <laughs> up, are we? But I learned my lesson, right? <laughs> like, I completely learned my lesson. And um, the first person that's ever shown me that love is not transactional, yeah. like, it's strange to be intimate yeah. in that way. Right. Um, it takes a lot I would me. love to do a whole episode on that, too. Oh, transactional yes. versus... Okay, we'll spend yeah. more time together. Yeah, we will. Well, by the way, her yes. book, um, is really Nice. Yeah, she's she's amazing. So had, when you were at um, you being Kyle, because um, I'm pointing and I don't know if you can see what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, but um, when you were at Landmark and you went and you met her, what happened? What was the conversation like? It was 
it's one of those times in life that you just feel an instant connection right mm. away. Like, even though, like, I think I was, you know... Like, you're supposed to know a person. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I just felt it right away. And she was, like, one of those people that, you know, could just knock me down, but knock me into the sense that I needed to do what I needed to do. And I just felt a comfort to her, um, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm, I'm an extrovert type person. So, you know, being... I don't know what led me to, out of all the other staff that worked at Landmark, um, you know, but something led me to her to say I want to stay the 47 days and she actually looked at me and she said nobody has ever asked us to stay the entire program she was like I'm blown away mm, and I don't <laughs> yeah I, I, I don't even know what it was so instead of you know fighting things like which which I saw a lot of people do they fought the program I was like how can I help you you know? That is the mm -hmm. most important message I feel in all these episodes, um, interviewing people from recovery facilities, um, that the attitude of the person who goes to rehab after rehab after rehab, who isn't at a position where they are all in, where they're committed, mm -hmm. where they're hungry, where their yeah. ears are now able to hear, mm -hmm. and they're hungry. They want, like, you going and working there, you going and being there, and the two of you wanting so much to be the sponge, wanting so much to heal, wanting so much to have a better life. There's something when we're out of our own way and we're in alignment with that, that our soul is able to go, okay, now mm -hmm. it's on. Mm -hmm. well, and, I can and, and all the teachers you. appear yeah. because the student is ready. I can tell you just my experience watching her. You get those people because you you feel very isolated to begin with when you go into a program like that. And mm -hmm. you really don't know what to expect or mm -hmm. what to do, especially me. It was my first time going. Mm -hmm. um, when you get people like, like Teresa, you... I, I just watched people come out of the masses that would all, you know, be very connected to her. Mm -hmm. They literally would just, out of everybody, they would just connect to this person. And I think that's so powerful. And when she shared her story, it affected me. Mm -hmm. It affected, you know, it affects men too, um, to hear women's perspectives on mm -hmm. life. And I, it makes me reflect on what I've done, what selfishness things I've done as a man and things like that. And I think, you know, even though we weren't, you know, connected, you, you you shared personalities of how I can change my life in the future and towards other women. Thank you, Kyle. Well, I feel like a big motivator, especially in Kyle's um, situations. I saw a lot of myself in you. You know, mm. you did come in a little high and mighty, right? <laughs> and I feel like it really had to be a reality check um, for how serious this disease is and the fact that you're mm. fighting for your life. And but you have to give yourself all the credit because you did this. You know, this was yeah. you. Like we're, it we're does here. Take that. Yeah. Yeah. It does take. It does take. I know. Like we. We have a higher power, and we're we're super um, surrendered to that higher power, that intuition, whatever you want to call it, you call it God or not. But and we want to be able to be humble enough and appreciative enough to be able to give credit to the guidance that we're getting, the way that are appearing, the people that are showing up, the the miracles that are happening. Um, but it is also our us being in alignment with that that our will is now, our attitude, our story about ourselves, our agenda is now in alignment. So instead of fighting that intuition and running from ourselves and putting towels over mirrors, mm -hmm. you know, and seeking it in the approval or whatever, that we're now going, okay, what's the next right step? How can I learn? I wanna know, I wanna understand this. I wanna go in and I wanna start working out this stuff so that I can be comfortable in my own skin and I can be genuinely helpful in this world. And so. Yeah, that's beautiful. And so um, if you were to, if somebody was interested in Landmark Recovery as a facility to go to, what would you like to say about Landmark specifically that you love so much about working there and that what you feel benefits people? I feel like in Landmark's case specifically, the culture is like the make it or break it. There's generally the staff there. They've I have staff um, that are actually clients at Landmark at one time, and then they came on as techs or they came on as case managers. And I feel like that makes the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. um, you have people there that either are in recovery, that have people that are close to them in recovery, and they genuinely care. They take the time to sit there and talk to you. I've had, I've had clients that I've had to talk to for eight hours and go mm -hmm. through all the different reasons that they feel like they don't need to be there in order to motivate right. them to finish. Right. Like, and it's that time, it's that extra oomph that matters. It's not one of those places where you're gonna be like, hey, 
I'm good. I have the cure for addiction. We're going to be like, okay, bye. Right. No, we're going to sit down. We're going to go through all the reasons that you have, really get to the root, come up with solution. And, you know, every now and then there are all those people that just aren't ready. They're just not right. there yet. And right. we pray and we hope but that they make it But seeds get back. planted. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's interesting to say also that when we are um, in our addiction, so like I said before, we have that split mind where we have part of our mind that says, I got it. I'm okay. Nothing to see here. And then we have this other side that says, oh my God, nobody can help me. This is too bad. I can't do this. Mm -hmm. what, how, what, how, what do they know about this and et cetera. And, um, but we have this idea that if I am an addict or I'm not an addict, if I am an alcoholic or I'm not an alcoholic, we still, we don't understand what that really means. And so in that moment we think it's just a problem with alcohol or drugs. And, um, and if a person goes with a closed mind through the entire rehab process and walks out with the same perspective that they may or may not be an addict or consider themselves an alcoholic, um, but even if they do admit that they are, they may still think that because the mind is closed and they haven't sought cause and condition that the problem is still the alcohol and the drugs. And it's, it's not. So I love that, you know, when you were first sharing, Kyle, you talked about going deeper and understanding about your character defects and, and that it doesn't start when you're necessarily in addiction and when you first pick up a drug or alcohol, which a lot of people think that your issue started when you first started drinking and doing drugs and don't think about the mind that wants to drink and do the drugs, why it sees it as a solution, why it clicks on it in the first place. And then for you, when you're sharing about landmark and about how you know they will sit with a person and they will help them to see that it is not the superficial problem and solution that they think that it is mm -hmm. and so that's wonderful so i really appreciate you telling your story and i would love to have you on again and um and this whole episode is really super powerful so thank you again thank you for joining us and thank you for joining us today on the real recovery show we'd like to give a special thanks to our sponsor and gracious host phlv radio here in las vegas see you next week